Good afternoon from Singapore and to all our friends tuning in from all around the world. Thank you and welcome to today's session. We'll be talking about energy systems of the future. My name is Wei from SG Novit, and for those who may know, SG Novit is a government-backed deep tech investor and company builder whose mission is to help entrepreneurial scientists build deep tech startups that are looking to solve big global problems. Our work also involves building a global community of leaders, thinkers, and doers to drive and scale up deep tech innovations in areas such as AI, healthcare, quantum tech, and autonomous technology across various industries. As Singapore chart its way towards the Green Plan 2030, five pillars have been identified that will have an influence on all our lives. Namely, city in nature, energy reset, sustainable living, green economy, and resilient future. Today, together with the French Chambers, we bring you this webinar where our speakers will dive deeper into the energy reset. We will look into energy systems of the future and reimagine Singapore as a place where we use cleaner energy and increase energy efficiency to lower our carbon footprint. For today's webinar, we encourage all attendees to share with us your thoughts on the topic or interact with our speakers by posting your questions in the Q&A tab located at the bottom panel of your screen. Otherwise, feel free to just say hi and do a quick shout out from where you are in the chat box below. With no further ado, do allow me to pass the time to Lida Fulton, Head of Member Services and Communication from the French Chamber of Commerce for opening remarks too. Lydia, please. Thank you very much, Wevin. Thank you all. Um, my name is Lydia Fulton. So I'm the Head of Member Services and Communication at the French Chamber of Commerce in Singapore, mainly in charge of all the committees, events, and communication. Part of our mission is to accelerate the development of French company in the local market and to develop business relations between our members and the Singapore business community. On behalf of the French Chamber, I'm thrilled to co-host and partner with SJ Innovate this virtual uh, event today, Energy Systems of the Future. Indeed, a sustainable development is definitely one of the main objectives of the French Chamber with the various uh, initiatives in place to mobilize the business community toward a sustainable economy and environment. And I invite you to contact us to know more about it. Finally, I would like to thank our great panelist members and partners for their insight and sharing today. Thank you very much. Please, Simon, the mic is yours. Thank you, Lydia. Uh, and again, thank you to, uh, and, and introductions, I guess, to Thomas, uh, Lynette, and Emir uh, for joining us today uh, to discuss energy systems of the future. Um, just quickly, uh, I am Deputy Director of our Venture Investment Team and sit across uh, investment and growth of our sustainability portfolio at SG Innovate. Uh, so I would like to start, I think, uh, hearing from the panelists themselves, maybe they can uh, spend a few minutes introducing uh, themselves and, uh, and we can go from there. Uh, so maybe Thomas, we can start with you. Thanks a lot, Simon. Uh, good afternoon to all. I'm Tom Abodlo, I'm CEO of NG for our Southeast Asia activities. And for those who don't know NG, we're uh, a global utility player who really help its customer, whether they're B2Bs or cities, to engage into their low carbon transition. Essentially, it consists of two things, getting access to whomever wants to green energy and help our partners to reduce their energy consumption. And for this, we are happy to help our clients strategize their transformation journey towards low carbon, but also to come up with fully um, packaged solution that NG can implement in a completely risk-free uh, approach and, and finance if our cl clients are keen to do so. Th thank you for inviting me today. I'm very uh, glad to, uh, to participate to this discussion about tomorrow's uh, energy systems. Thank you, Thomas. I think we're excited to have you here. Uh, maybe, Amir, can you share a little bit uh, with us about uh, yourself and introduce uh, Resync? Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Amir. I'm CEO and co-founder of Resync. Uh, we are a Singapore-based startup, three years old, and one of the portfolio companies of SG Innovate. Uh, we provide AI-driven machine learning models uh, for energy uh, efficiency solutions. Uh, we mainly work B2B with um, enterprises and businesses in energy space and real estate space, telecommunications, um, and elect electrical mobility, EV mobility. So uh, we use machine learning uh, in combination with uh, deep technical knowledge in uh, control systems for energy and power systems and make sure that the digitalization happening in a very smooth manner. So thanks a lot for having me on the panel. I'm really happy uh, to be part of this panel. 
Our pleasure, Amir. Always good to showcase some of our uh, exceptional portfolio companies such as yourself, right? Thank uh, you. <laughs> Lynette, uh, so nice to have you here. Thank you. Uh, would you share with us a little bit about your role and, uh, and uh, I, I guess, uh, Capitaland for those who are not familiar? Absolutely. Thank you, Simon, for having me here. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Lynette Leong. I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer of uh, Capitaland Group. Uh, for those of you who do not know Capital Land, if you're not living in a HDB flat, you probably are living in one of our condos or you probably will shop at our malls, hmm. uh, work in our office buildings or uh, maybe in our business park, or industrial park and operate in our data center. So uh, this is what we do. Uh, we are not only a Singapore company, uh, we have uh, global operations in more than 230 cities in over 30 countries um, and our I've just named a few of types of our real estate classes but uh, it is quite diverse as you can see so my role is uh, to embed sustainability into all our business operations and at the same time ensure that we deliver sustainable financial performance and hopefully ensure everybody's job is sustainable as well uh, I've been with uh, Capital Land for 13 years, so prior to my role two years ago, I was the CEO of uh, uh, the Capital Land Group's uh, commercial real estate business. So happy to be here to, uh, with our esteemed panelists as well, and together with you, Simon. Thank you, Lynette. I, I think uh, I'm lucky to share the stage with, uh, with all three of you. Uh, so I actually, Lynette, I, I kind of want to start with you because I think you bring this incredible perspective um, from uh, and, and you sit at the juncture between, you know, wearing your commercial hat and making sure that things are commercially sustainable, as you say, with, um, you know, what the, what the board and, and, and some of your shareholders are now thinking about when it comes to sustainability and energy and things like this. When you talk to when you talk to the board and shareholders and, and you know, the I guess, uh, you know, when you uh, have chats with, uh, with with people in, in, in your shoes and other companies. What are the, the the trends that you see? You know, can you set the, sh the stage for us in terms of you know, what what are what, what's the investors and 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 board really asking you to do in your role? Mm. It's a good question. Um, this is an evolving question, I guess. Um, I, I think that the there is a recognition that climate change is an existential threat and that uh, it takes the entire ecosystem to solve uh, the world's problems. Um, and uh, there is uh, a lot of uh, momentum being built in this area, especially from our investors front. Uh, the institutional investors are all uh, looking at allocating capital to where uh, the companies are uh, able to deliver and also prove that they are financially sustainable. So financially sustainable would also be dependent on the business operations and how sustainable we are. In the real estate business or in the built environment that we're in, uh, our, well, our buildings actually contribute at least 40% to global carbon emissions. And uh, that is a pretty significant figure that uh, we have to look at. And that's where I think um, deep tech innovation comes into play to see how we're able to reduce carbon emissions. Uh, reducing in the form of, uh, I think, the, the type of the production of energy, uh, production of energy, the way we manage energy, the way we use energy and optimize energy as well. So I think since this is a, a conference re in relation to energy, I'll just focus on, on energy because in sustainability, there are many aspects to it. And, uh, you know, I think I can speak till the cows come home. So let's just, I will just focus on, on the energy front. Um, so I think the, the board they has recognition and the also investors all um, are looking to real estate companies on reducing carbon emissions. And the largest component is really from energy consumption. So what is the source of energy uh, other than just solar that we, we are able to uh, secure? Um, and what is important is um, in a whole portfolio of properties, the majority of real estate are completed buildings. And so uh, how do you then look at the energy reduction or uh, optimization of uh, energy 
within our existing portfolio. Um, and uh, for our the properties that are under construction, other than just the consumption of energy, it is also about the energy that's been used to produce the building materials. Yeah, so that is another aspect. Um, and uh, so I think it, it co energy covers such a wide spectrum of the entire value chain that uh, you really have to um, use a lot of innovation to, to uh, optimize the consumption. Right, I, I think that sets the stage nicely for us, thank you. And I think uh, we can come back uh, throughout the discussion and talk about maybe the different areas and, and you know the different priorities within those areas. But I think that does a great job, thank you, Lynette, of, uh, of setting that stage for us. Uh, Thomas, I, I, I kind of want to hear from you with this, because I, 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 you share a, a perspective in one way and uh, I guess are a little bit different in another way. Is these, are these the sort of um, feedback that you get from your customers when you're looking at smart cities or uh, you know, these sort of projects? What, what are you, their priorities that, they, that you see them coming to you with? Well, I think uh, Lynette has, has captured the, the, the essential aspects, uh, which are that sustainability is on the top of the mind of pretty much everybody today. We, we, we might have feared that uh, you know, COVID would have put uh, the climate change at the back of our mind and deprioritize, if you wish, the, 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 the climate threat that needs to be tackled um, right now if you want to, uh, to be able to meet this challenge. And to the contrary, uh, when we engage our clients, whether they are real estate developers, industry players, or data centers, sustainability always comes first uh, in our discussion, which is a, a very positive sign. Of course, along with sustainability, uh, financial and, and economic uh, sense has to be here, but the real um, change we have seen happen, the shift we have seen happening in the, in the market in the, in the recent years is that today, sustainable products are already the cheapest or, or make already the, the best economic sense. So. It's the ideal time uh, right here, right now to engage for any group, any B2B player, any cities into its, uh, its, its energy transition. It's gonna be a, a long journey. It's a 10, 20 year journey. We, we cannot uh, with a magic wand go to, uh, to zero carbon uh, in, in, a, in a very, very short time. But there is already a range of solution that you can implement that will cut your carbon emission very substantially uh, and help you uh, become uh, leaner uh, uh, as a business. And if I take some, uh, uh, some examples, I think Lynette has been uh, very clear in, uh, in the untapped potential of, of brownfield, brownfield uh, buildings, that, that those buildings who have been built a uh, few years back on, on old technologies and who are not necessarily equipped with the state of the art uh, uh, IoT system, um, energy efficient systems, you, you can buy um, retrofitting them and, and, and have a, a holistic approach and make them much more efficient. Solar energy is another aspect where you can do wonder. Today, solar energy is the cheapest form of energy you can get in Singapore, in Malaysia, in, in the Philippines, for example. It's easy to derive 20, 30% discount on your utility bill by uh, using uh, using the, 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 the space you have on your rooftop and put on solar. So what we're advising our clients is uh, not to wait any longer and really maximize the space they have uh, for the usage of solar. I can go on. Uh, there are a lot of things to do around uh, cooling. Um, the, 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 the cooling of the region is a, a major topic for Southeast Asia. We, we foresee that with the economic growth, with the, with the urbanization rate, the cooling need will, will, uh, uh, will double in the next 10 years, which is absolutely uh, a huge challenge to tackle. So there needs innovation to, to, uh, to, 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 uh, to cool more efficiently buildings. There are already things you can do at a, at a district level to, uh, uh, to uh, be more efficient uh, with shared infrastructure such as district cooling, for example. District cooling is a, is a very efficient way to, uh, um, to provide air conditioning to a cluster of buildings, a small city. 
uh, but but more is to come uh, with new material uh, that are uh, more e efficient at carrying um, cooling that are more that have uh, interesting uh, physical proprieties. I'm, I'm thinking about uh, fa phase change material, for example. More can be done um, in the storage space. Um, more can be done in, in the in the digital space to uh, to use. Uh, all the data we collect from our buildings and, and, to, uh, and to work to, to, to integrate our systems, our energy systems, and make them much more efficient. So it's quite a, it's quite a, a, a very, I'm not going to say nice place to be because there is this threat of climate change, but it's a very exciting time uh, to be working in the, in the energy space right now. And there are so much we can already implement uh, with our partners that uh, uh, it, it keeps us really uh, busy at night. Yeah, I, I agree. And it seems very much that uh, over the last few years, uh, the, you know, the, the cost of, of energy and the ability to retrofit brownfield sites has came to a point where this makes a lot of financial sense as well as a lot of sense with an ESG lens and things like this. So I think uh, I agree with you, quite an exciting time uh, in the industry. Um, and Amir, I, I think uh, this segues nicely to you, right? Uh, I think with these kind of general market dynamics as a backdrop, maybe you can share with the audience a little bit about um, you know how, how and why you founded Resync and, and really um, the, the, the part of the market that you're targeting at the moment. Sure. Um, my background is in microelectronics and I did my studies in electrical electronics uh, at NTU. And then I worked as an R&D engineer for a solar company. Uh, it's a Norwegian solar company called REC Solar. And being in the uh, solar industry, I saw what are the challenges and what are the uh, new potentials that can be done in the market. And that's why uh, after four years being an R&D team, I decided to uh, join Entrepreneur First. Um, and uh, together with my co-founder, we founded Resync and started working on energy efficiency because um, three years back, we knew that um, the whole industry is moving towards more digital, more sustainable um, uh, ecosystem. So there's a lot of potential, a lot of room for the innovation, especially energy efficiency. Uh, as mentioned by Lynette and Thomas, you know, um, the whole value chain need to have a exactly the same mindset. So it takes the effort from everyone, from uh, technology adopters like Capital Land, from, um, you know, uh, technology enablers like uh, NG and technology providers like we see, to have the same mindset of uh, there is a need for sustainable solutions um, and we are ready and open to try uh, to test, to adopt, and to see where it leads us. Um, and for us, that we think, I think, um, as mentioned by Thomas, uh, it's a right place, right time. Um, um, the whole industry is going through transformation, and this transformation is mainly driven by, uh, you know, renewables, digitalization, adoption of energy storage systems like batteries. We see huge boom with electric vehicles, and of course, adoption of AI and machine learning models for the automation purposes. So just perfect timing for us to jump onto the train. Uh, but at the same time, being in Singapore is a huge privilege for us because uh, Singapore is well known for always being one step ahead of all other countries in terms of technology adoption, in terms of you know, uh, technology implementation. Um, and that's why it was just perfect timing for us. Um, so that's where we started um, working on energy efficiency solutions. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, that's, I think, quite nice, right? Uh, yeah. So uh, I'm going to just jump to an audience question here. And just, just for the audience, um, there is a Q&A box at the bottom. Please feel free to, to answer questions. Uh, we will come to them uh, during uh, the panel. And also the panelists can write direct responses and answers to these questions as well as we go along. Um, but so, so there's an interesting question here around uh, EVs and how we generate the power ultimately destined for the EV, right? Um, the, the EV is not so green if it's been powered by natural gas compared to something like low carbon uh, uh, power generation. So I think, Thomas, maybe a question for you. When we think about low carbon technologies in Singapore, um, what would you like to see kind of this, you know, 10, 20 year plan for Singapore in, in, in uh, the um, lens of low carbon power generation? 
Oh, sure. Uh, it, it's important to keep in mind that uh, Singapore has a very challenging uh, set of natural boundaries. Huh? The, the, the island is relatively limited in, in terms of space. And therefore, there is a limit to what you can deploy in terms of um, solar capacity, for example. Uh, I think even if we were to cover all the rooftop available and most of the roads, you, you wouldn't get more than 15 to 20 percent of your energy consumption coming from the sun. As uh, for other renewable energy sources, unfortunately, it's not possible to build a hydro dam in Singapore. There is no wind. So um, you will have to rely on, on other uh, approaches. Uh, some may be very innovative, some may be uh, more about uh, how, how to deal with other countries surrounding Singapore. So in, in the innovation space, one approach that could be taken by the country is to move towards green hydrogen. Green hydrogen um, can be produced from energy, uh, renewable energy sources uh, like the, the solar power or the wind. Uh, and Australia, for example, which is not too far, is a perfect place to do that. There is space, there is access to water, there is access to those energy renewable sources. So you can imagine produce a fully green hydrogen that could be shipped or uh, transported to, uh, to Singapore and then re repurpose the gas infrastructure of Singapore to use this green hydrogen. Uh, progressively, it could be first uh, in the first step uh, to blend uh, gas and hydrogen together and within 10 to 20 year time frame, completely switch to, uh, to, to green hydrogen. That's not a dream. Huh? Today, uh, the technology exists. It's a bit expensive, it's a bit pricey, but by scaling it, uh, we firmly believe that within a 10 year time frame, uh, green hydrogen could become at cost parity with today's LNG cost. So it's one path, it's one road forward that Singapore could look to completely um, decarbonize its energy system. Another way is to work uh, by on, on integrating uh, the, the access to, um, to energy sources and, and leverage on what you could develop in Malaysia or, or in Indonesia, for example. In Malaysia, you have a lot of land uh, available. You could imagine deploy solar at scale, uh, leverage on the hydro that's produced in the country and import uh, energy, green energy to, uh, to Singapore. Uh, the answer might not be one or the other. It can, could be a blend of things. You want, obviously, in any scenario that you take, uh, keeping in mind decarbonization, you want to start working on electrifying as much as possible energy usage. Um, so if I come back to your initial remark on, uh, on EV, switching our, our park of uh, vehicles to, uh, to electric vehicle is the right move. Uh, I believe. And then you can work on, on, on uh, making the, the energy feed to those vehicles as green as possible. Uh, we have announced a, a partnership with Comfort Delgro uh, a few weeks ago that uh, specifically addressed this, uh, this ambition. Comfort wants to uh, turn their, their, their uh, fleet of uh, taxis and buses towards electric vehicles. So we will work on providing them the, the charging infrastructure um, to, to help their vehicle uh, re refuel in, in, uh, in electricity, if I can say it like that. And we will maximize um, the rooftop available on all the bus depot and the uh, taxi depot of Comfort to deploy solar and, and directly feed in uh, our charging network with green energy. That, that's very important. And along the way, if we can, we will seek to, uh, to play a, a very active role um, in supporting other uh, EV drivers in the country uh, and getting them access to those uh, uh, clean uh, and energy-based charging station points. I, I saw the partnership and I think uh, it, it's fantastic. I, I, you know, these are the sort of things that really move the needle when it comes to adoption and uh, you know, our journey along this. So, so congratulations on that. Uh, a question from the audience, Thomas, while we're, while we're talking, I think uh, probably quite a quick one. Uh, a question about wave power generation. I imagine, uh, you know, I've been down to Sentosa, not so many waves in Singapore, but this could be done in partnership with one of our neighbors or something like this. Yes, uh, the technology is interesting. Uh, as, as 
with a lot of other promising areas, uh, the, the, the capability to reach scale and economies of scale will be critical to make this source of energy compete uh, with other ones. Because at the end of the day, uh, renewable can only survive if, if the premium attached to it is as small as possible, or if even if the, the green energy, like the one from the sun, becomes the, the cheapest on the market. I agree. I agree. Okay. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, so Lynette, uh, a question from you. Uh, I, I wanted to talk to you about this and I think um, uh, some Q&A from the audience that we can combine in, into a question. But when we think about the SG Green Plan uh, and we think about um, Capilan striving towards some sort of um, you know, carbon neutrality or zero carbon future, what do you see as a business as the really big kind of challenges that you need to overcome? I, I know that Capiland have been very active uh, in the sustainability space for some time, but uh, you know, th as anything, there's a, there is a, a long journey ahead. What are these kind of big challenges that you see as a business? Right. Um, well, I think uh, Thomas has, um, pointed out a few very key points. And uh, one of them is the, I think the, on the technology side, that uh, in order to uh, achieve the very ambitious targets that the country has set, or Singapore has set for itself, and also within Capital Land, we have also set very ambitious targets for the next 10 years in terms of uh, the reduction of our carbon emissions. So that tech, the current technology uh, we don't think is, is able to solve such a problem. So I think the continual uh, innovation in deep tech uh, is absolutely necessary. Uh, as a result of that, we have uh, also uh, launched a sustainability challenge in November last year, where we are trying to crowdsource solutions from all over the world. And uh, this is our inaugural challenge. And thankfully we have uh, managed to uh, attract more than uh, almost 200 submissions from over 30 countries. Uh, this is just a beginning and uh, we hope that with this continual uh, uh, encouragement uh, we are able to garner more participation. And I think the other aspect is the collaboration is very important because the problems cannot be solved by any single party alone. And we need to collaborate with industry partners uh, as well as um, the government. So I think the challenge is besides technology, uh, I feel it's also about the business model, whether um, I think there's not enough uh, being done to promote the benefits or the economics of um, being sustainable. So the, uh, all these technologies are very capital intensive. Uh, the government has done well in, in the green plan to promote green finance. Uh, and I think this is uh, absolutely in the right direction. Uh, however, um, bankers are being bankers. Um, they may, they may, I'm not sure how many engineers there are in the banking industry who really understand the, the, the engineering side and the technology side and how that translates to benefits. So you see that a lot of the, the green finance, I think is, is uh, uh, you, you're, you're seeing banks wanting to promote green finance. However, the cost of finance is still not too low enough. There's still not a differentiation between more sustainable buildings and less sustainable buildings. Interest rates are still about the same. So there's no differentiation. And I think one of the problems is perhaps there's not enough focus on translating energy savings into dollars and cents. So that, uh, so I think in the deep tech area, there is, uh, I, there is a lot of work done in smart facilities management, for example, in um, being able to, um, monitor energy savings. It's still not perfect yet. I think there's a lot of development in that area. I think the next step to do is really to translate that into actual, actual savings in dollars and cents. That will be very helpful for a start. And, uh, and then that, that kind of data will be important for banks, for insurance companies as well. So I'm, I, I hope that, my hope is really to see insurance premium being reduced 
as a result of being sustainable. And that will also lead to valuers, real estate appraisers, recognizing the, that sustainable buildings are more valuable and they will increase valuation for these buildings. So I think that, uh, that, that value chain is still not realized yet. So hopefully with data analytics, uh, with uh, uh, smart building systems, that can actually be fully integrated to translate that into uh, actual economics of uh, all these capital intensive projects. So I think that challenge, uh, it remains. Uh, so on the, both on the technical side as well as on the financial side. Yeah, and I, I think, uh, I, th I thank you for bringing that up because uh, it, it's not all, you know, we are at maybe the sea change where the cost of, uh, you know, low carbon energy has come down to a point where, you know, it makes a lot of sense, but there are still a lot of other factors that uh, impact a, a large business's ability to do all these things, right? And I think when you talk about insurance and these sort of things, everyone needs to move together on this. Exactly. Um, and it's we're maybe not there yet, right? We've had a few people move and, and things, we've made some really good progress, uh, but we need to sit down uh, and objectively kind of measure what kind of impact this has had and then feed it back into the, the models that, that do impact businesses every day. Right. So I, I don't want to sound as though I'm a pessimist. I'm actually an optimist. No, I, I like it because so. I think you wear, you know, you're wearing this very commercial hat, which is a, a hat that I wear in, in my business work as well. So I, I understand, I think. Right. Yeah. So, but I think that there are, uh, it's very exciting. This space is what Thomas and uh, Amir have, have mentioned. There's a, uh, we're moving in the right direction and uh, it's, it's still, we're, we're we are part of this journey and development is being made on the engineering side. So I'm just hoping that the next step will be really to translate that into real dollars and cents. Got it. Uh, we also hope for that as well, I think. I think everyone's quite aligned. So Emiya, I, I, I want to ask you now, now that we're talking about, you know, technology's role in this, you know, there are such huge challenges when we think about energy. And as Lynette and Thomas have kind of, you know, talked about, there are a lot of different stakeholders involved. What do you see the role for startups in this? You know, you've been a startup yourself, having to talk to people uh, like maybe NG and Capital Land and, and other big businesses. What's, what's the role that you see for a company like yours? I think uh, the company like our, like Resync, we, we are technology providers. Uh, but I think one of the really important uh, things to keep in mind for early stage startups is that, um, as mentioned by the net, we always have to make sure that our technology converts in dollar and cents to the end users, right? So it attracts uh, the demand from the end users. And how to do that, it's not an easy job. Uh, but what we believe in at Resync is that uh, clustering few value propositions together and giving it uh, as a proposal to the end user. So for example, three years ago, Resync started with specific focus on renewable asset management solution. So we used to work with EPC engineering procurement construction companies, solar developers, o &M companies for uh, solar and wind power plants. Uh, we understood what are the challenges for, uh, for the end users. We sold our solution at very cheap price, uh, but the main focus was to aggregate the data from the end user to learn what's happening at the sites in terms of the generation, renewable generation assets. And we learned on the on a go, so by using the end customer data, but at the same time, of course, provide certain value proposition to them. But then by using that data, we move toward the smart building solution where we combine generation plus consumption data. So we started to analyze what's happening at the consumption of the end customer, how they consume, what type of assets they're using, what type of assets are consuming the most at what period, uh, at what time, and et cetera. And how we can combine it with renewable energy assets or with the uh, energy storage systems that are basically penetrating the market nowadays. So that creates a new revenue stream for the end user because it's not just purely installing solar on your rooftop, but now it's combining your uh, consumption with the gen uh, variable generation of the renewables. And of course, flexibility of energy storage systems. Um, and then from there, we basically understood that, okay, solar margins are very small. So we cannot just sustain providing, you know, o &M solution or monitoring management solution to the uh, solar companies. Then we moved to smart buildings, which opening up quite a lot of opportunities. There's a huge room for the smart households where basically um, we can analyze um, 
the performance of, or, or I would say, consumption of the end household without installing any hardware. So there is this solution called NILM, NILM, non-intrusive load monitoring. So purely based on an energy meter data from the households, we can analyze at what time and what type of asset was operated. So now instead of household getting the energy value once per month, they can get the real-time perform uh, real-time consumption data with you know breakdown and disaggregation of what type of load we use without installing any additional hardware, purely relying on an AMI advanced metering infrastructure, which is basically what Singapore is moving towards right now, right? And so that gives and opens up a lot of different rooms. So that's why the, the, the important mindset of the startup should be that we should not focus only on a specific domain, you know, and dive deeper, 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 but try to find out more verticals where we can add additional value proposition to the end user. So be it on monitoring and management of renewable energy assets, be it a demand response for the consumption uh, and electricity savings, and be it a facility management improvement where you can basically, you know, if there's any failure or predictive maintenance that is required on the side, you can basically automatically by using AI assign certain manpower to take care. So that basically re re reduces the man hours uh, of the facility managers uh, on the side, right? Um, so the, that clustering of value proposition is one of the important aspects, I would say, for the, uh, mm. for the startups like ours. And, and another thing, yeah. All right. I was going to say some quite interesting interplay uh, between, you know, when you start talking about technology, but also innovation of business models uh, with yeah. Lynette's comments previously, right? There needs to be yeah. this kind of change in business models. You can't yeah. just sell something how you would, might like to sell something. That's not necessarily what the, the end consumer uh, may, may like it. Yeah, I mean, it's always like that, right? I mean, if you look at the solar uh, business 20, 30 years ago, it was not, uh, it didn't make any uh, I mean, dollar value sense, right? I mean, like governments were providing subsidies for people to adopt it. Uh, and once adoption became uh, at the largest scale, then basically the technology evolved to the level where people started to understood that, you know, this makes dollar and cent value and people believed in the technology on a longer run. And then basically after the, you know, uh, wide adoption of renewables, companies started to innovate and in how to, you know, use renewables on a different uh, scale, on a different level, for example, use it on a brownfield or use it on uh, newly built uh, power plants and etc. So it basically opens up new rooms down the road. But the important thing is to believe in the technology at the beginning. So that's why I'm saying it's a collective mindset, right? It's important for the technology adopters to believe in the technology and it's important for technology enablers and technology providers to ensure that this technology has a future for the end user. So um, yeah, that what will drive. And in one comment on a, you know EV and mobility that we were talking, about, it comes to a similar uh, level. So we should not look only at the EV and um, from perspective that oh we are not going to use fossil fuels and it will save a lot by using fuel on renewables, right? But we should look also from the perspective how we can utilize EVs on a different level. So instead of just using uh, unidirectional charging of the EVs. We can now, I mean, there are already uh, projects where people think of bi-directional charging. So it's um, uh, G to V, V to G. So basically within the buildings, let's say office buildings, uh, on a car parks, there will be charging stations we can ch which can charge and we can, which can discharge basically from the EVs. Um, and that basically means that if, you know, 20% of people in, um, who are driving to the offices have EVs, and they park it in a car park of the of the of that building. That means they have specific amount of energy storage within that building, which can be used for the demand response purposes for that building, right? Um, and and provides additional incentive to the to the building. So this is something that is really really interesting and opens up new doors for the uh, you know new innovations. Um, yeah, so we should look from that perspective as well. Super interesting, actually. I never I never kind of had that broken down. So very interesting. And, and again, business models, right? Yeah. Uh, once you can do the, you know, technically, uh, you know, a little bit of a challenge maybe, but actually rolling that business model out and educating stakeholders and, you know, demonstrating financial incentives, very important. Yeah. Simon, can I just uh, uh, add to what Amir has said? I think he's brought up several very strong points about uh, demand response, about user requirements. And I think that uh, I'm, I'm looking to uh, energy systems being flexible enough to really detect responses 
to according to demand requirements and i think that's a question relating to that and how uh how how does energy um the provision of energy respond to the minute level of uh say uh, someone in the office and i think there are several systems right now that are trying to do that where you're able to regulate the the temperature or the the energy required to power the air conditioning according to the needs of the the user um, it is almost like the district cooling system the district cooling system is for large scale projects where you regulate the different types of uh, systems according to the needs of each building each building requires but then if you reduce that to the micro level to a single user level are you still able to regulate that you know so how how far can you do that and then that will actually help to um, optimize your energy requirements according to the needs of uh, different needs and di at different times of the day. And, uh, uh, and, but in addition to that, I think it's also important to start educating uh, consumers about the use of energy. So if you have data like that, that can start to, to um, help people to regulate first, and then from there, the data will help to edu in turn educate users, the consumers, to not waste energy and to use it at the right time. So I think if you have uh, such a, a dual, uh, um, you know, reinforcing system, I think that will be really perfect. Can I just yeah. add quickly, um, uh, I think that's, that's the perfect uh, highlight because um, uh, it's not only by the uh, technology uh, in terms of energy efficiency in terms of uh, demand response. So for demand response, I'll just quickly mention there are a lot of opportunities. Of course, we talk about HVAC control based uh, on an occupancy of the building, based on a indoor temperature, outdoor temperature, even based in Singapore, uh, two years ago, we started, we opened up a wholesale market. So every building, contestable building can bid for, for the electricity directly from the wholesale market. So if you're, if you're pricing of electricity changing every 30 minutes, you can do uh, load shifting, you can do peak shaving, based demand response, and etc. So, uh, and that basically, because HVAC corresponds to the largest uh, consumption asset within the buildings most of the time, uh, real, um, real time control of the HVAC system can save you a lot of money. And we did that uh, analysis, and we basically last year even received a grant from EMA Energy Market Authority of Singapore or to commercialize our solution of direct um, AI based HVAC system control. Uh, but also, as mentioned by the net, it's also important to match the end users because it's not only the HVAC system, but the rest of the assets that can be um, reduced by the total behavior change of the end user. So that basically, um, if we educate the end users saying like, hey, if you don't consume at least for, uh, you know, lights for this amount of time, you save this much of uh, energy or you basically save this much of money. So one of the experiments that we did, I don't know if maybe some of the audience are aware, we did the experiment with CNA, Channel New Asia, uh, for eight weeks. And there was a documentary last month. It's a four episode documentary called Climate Change. I think NG was there as well as part of it. Um, so what experiment we did with households is basically we just monitor the energy consumption and we break down uh, the energy consumption and nudge the end user. We didn't take any real-time control, but we just nudge end user every day. So one week we just nudge them, hey, today you will save this much of kilowatt hours according to, based on your you know, last month consumption. And the next week we told them, hey, today you save this much of money, like 20 cents or $1 compared to last month consumption. And then the last week, we basically gave them the carbon footprint uh, feedback. So we saw, hey, today you save this much of, uh, this many of trees and this much of carbon uh, emitted to the, uh, you know, to the open area. And that basically changed their behavior. Without any real-time control, we managed to save up to 30% of the energy consumption on their next electricity bill, which is impressive, right? Which exactly what Lynette mentioned. I mean, like it's a nudging the end user and changing their behavior. But that's also one of the technology. Some super interesting parallels with uh, with healthcare and things like that about how you nudge people to look look after themselves better. Uh, quite interesting, Thomas. Like at NG, do you see uh, you talk to your customers or your customers ask, ask questions about this? Um, you know how how you work with the end users of your solution um, to reduce uh, energy usage. Yeah, I think I, I concur with. Uh, 
what has been shared by, by Lynette and, and Emir. Um, Singapore is very advanced and, uh, and quite good when it comes to norms for efficiencies of uh, rela relating uh, to, uh, to the efficiency with which we, we produce um, HVAC air conditioning in buildings. And it's much more advanced that, than other countries in the region, meaning uh, when you want to produce HVAC in an office, uh, usually you, you will find that, that the, the chillers that, in the, uh, that are in the, in the building do it quite, quite well and, and for a, quite a, a reasonable uh, cost. But it goes only so far uh, as the usage you make of this air conditioning. If you, uh, and maybe it will be very familiar for, for Singapore, and if, if you cool your facilities at 18 degrees 24 seven, then you lose all the benefits you, you get from uh, being efficient at producing your, your air conditioning. So I concur with what was shared. We, we do a lot in this area with our uh, partners. Uh, interestingly, if I take an example, we, we have worked with a green mark platinum building in um, in Singapore, which is the, the toughest efficiency norm you can find for, for, uh, for a building. We have deployed solutions uh, coming from, from partners like, like the company of, uh, of Emir uh, to, uh, to, to better uh, manage the automation of all systems and adjust the production of, uh, of air conditioning to match the usage that is done within the building. And without spending too much time, too much effort on this top-notch efficient building, we have reduced the, the energy consumption by 5%. And we know we can go uh, even higher. So with a very minimal cost initially, you, you can generate very big output. And, and that's, uh, that's very promising. And then on, on the front of uh, turning our consumer into what we call prosumer, yes, it, it will be something that will become the norm. As our house become energy producer with the solar that you will put on the rooftop, as our cars become a consumer and uh, exporter of energy to the grid, as Emir described, uh, we individually will have a lot, uh, a real role to play um, to, uh, to uh, consume more efficiently our energy and to participate to the, to the ecosystem to become an uh, energy suburb. So uh, it's not science fiction, it's not uh, technologies that will be mat maturing in a, in a 10 years time frame. We have things uh, that are necessary to be uh, much, much, much more sober for the same quality of usage, this is important, without penalizing ourselves, uh, keeping on living a, a, a very comfort lifestyle as we, as we like it. We have the technology to, uh, to, to be more sober, more cost effective. It's good for, it will be good for individual and, and for corporates. There is no doubt about that. And it all boils down again to business model, uh, that, that's a point I want to, uh, to emphasize again. Sorry if I repeat what has been said already, but today, one of the challenge is to work on, on mini proof of concept, if you wish, uh, to make one business case work well. But one, once you have uh, passed all the hurdles to convince one of your uh, type of user that, that the solution works well, then the, the, the challenge behind is to really scale what you have deployed. And, and uh, this is why uh, at NG, we, we really look uh, at new forms of doing business, partnering with real estate developers, partnering with data center developers um, to uh, agree on the initial solution that works, that makes sense uh, on their class of assets and then deploying it at scale, bringing financiers along the way that are very interested to have access to a, uh, to a new class of asset that is ESG or that ticks all the sustainability box. Um, for us, that, that's part of the, of the future solution because it will allow to accelerate uh, and, and really leverage on the solutions we already have today. Yeah, and I think, I mean, you reinforce business models because it's such a critical part of this, right? Uh, you can have all the great technology you like, but if you can't find a way for that to be a win-win amongst all the stakeholders, then uh, you know, commercialization implementation is going to be a bit tough. Where we are lucky again is that uh, the most cost-effective solution is the solution where we, you consume less energy. There is no cheaper energy than the one you don't consume, and there is a lot of solution you can implement today 
to achieve this. I agree. So uh, I think, you know, I, I had a whole list of questions that we haven't got to, and I think that's a great sign, right? We've had some, uh, some really interesting questions from the audience. And, uh, and I, I want to wrap it up and I want to do uh, a little bit of a, a lightning round for you three. Uh, are you familiar with this concept, right? Uh, just very short answers to, to these questions. Because um, I, I think uh, it'd be quite interesting, different perspectives amongst you all. So I, I'll, ask, I'll ask you all three questions and, and we can go from there very quickly, okay? So uh, first question for, you, for all three is, uh, I think if you could solve one technical problem, uh, you know, you have one silver bullet for a technical challenge when it comes to, to energy systems of the future. What is it going to be? Uh, maybe, Amir, we can, we can start with you uh, as the, as the uh, you know, technology provider here. Um, frankly speaking, I would say it's a data. So I would definitely be happy to see that data from different uh, assets, from different providers, can be found and can be analyzed. Uh, so it will definitely open up a lot of uh, new room and it speed up the adoption of energy efficiency solutions. Because nowadays, when we try to talk you know, to different type of HVAC system providers, when we try to talk to different type of solar inverters, when we try to talk to different type of I don't know, energy meters, it all comes with the different communication protocols. It all comes with the proprietary uh, detailed information and et cetera, right? So all these things uh, eventually have to be unified and it all have to be, uh, you know, intercommunicated because we are moving towards that digital uh, future where all the devices will communicate to each other. So I would feel that uh, this is one of the problems I would like to solve. And that's what we are trying to solve at the moment. as well. Fantastic. Thomas? Okay, I will go with a, a pipe dream. Cheap and efficient energy storage. Uh, we're, we're getting there within five, 10 years time, we will get there once we have that. Uh, the combination of, uh, of storage plus renewable uh, will be an unbeatable and, and that will be a, a massive game changer for uh, the energy landscape. Mm. I think there's some interesting things happening in kind of uh, short-term, long-term storage, right? Yes, yeah, so uh, state battery, hydrogen could be a form of storage, a number of uh, very exciting developments. Uh, the minute one of those gets industrialized, it will change our life. And that's very exciting. Isn't it, isn't it? Lynette, if there was uh, one technical problem with a silver bullet that you could solve uh, for the future of energy, what would it be? Uh, well, my dream is to be able to use as much energy as possible to power all sorts of things uh, without destroying the, the environment. So I would say it's the, the production of energy. It's uh, renewable energy. I think there are uh, known sources of uh, energy and, and deep tech innovation in certain areas. And I, probably the, the most recent of which is hydrogen. So uh, are there other sources um, and that are safe as well? So nuclear power was used, used to be one of the, the best, but well, in terms of safety, it's not there. So is there anything else that, that, that could probably could, could um, satisfy all, check the right boxes of uh, both efficiency and safety? Yeah, maybe we can uh, maybe we can get some nuclear fusion going on or something like this, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> Could be quite nice. Yes. Uh, okay, so so last question then. Um, I think, and I, I asked this with my startup hat on, right? Uh, I work with a lot of startups uh, during my day, and uh, always good to finish on how startups can get in contact with your businesses, right? If I'm, uh, you know, Amir at Resync or. Uh, I, I'm, I'm working on another challenge related to, to energy or, or perhaps more broadly sustainability. You know, how, how do we get in touch? Um, what are the kind of programs that your businesses are running? Uh, Lynette, well, maybe we can go back to you. Sorry, Simon, uh, I missed that question. Uh, if I'm a startup, how do I get in touch? Uh, what are the kind of programs that you're running? Okay, good question. Um, we just closed our submissions for the sustainability challenge. Um, and uh, I think it's very exciting space. Uh, we are really looking forward to seeing more innovations coming through this platform. Uh, our idea is to uh, pilot these projects at our properties around the world and to scale them up. 
So there are plenty of opportunities given that we are in different types of properties. So if you have an innovation that is relevant to, um, may not be relevant to one, but it's probably another one. So there are plenty of different sandboxes that one can pilot your projects in. Uh, so if you don't, you've missed this round, uh, try for the next round. If not, contact us directly with uh, your your solutions, and we'll be happy to to uh, um, to look at them. Fantastic, Thomas. How do how do we get in touch? Oh, very simply, we have created a body that is called NG Factory, and this uh, this body has for mission to uh, three things. First, to help startups that are promising in uh, the energy world to scale their business model and, and work with NG wherever possible. So we, we host them, we uh, share our, our, our um, touch points with, uh, with our clients. Uh, we try to cross pollinate our, our business models and, and, and to make uh, greater things uh, come from the combination of what they bring and what we already have. Uh, the second uh, aspect Factory is focusing on is to uh, build from, the, from scratch new ventures. Uh, we have had a, a call for founders very recently, and I was this afternoon, just before this uh, session, uh, discussing with one of our venture founders, um, and we were discussing how it would revolutionize the energy usage of uh, the light industry space, very promising. So he, he chose to focus on energy efficiency and, and we will support him in his uh, ambition. And the third aspect Factor is working on is um, more on a corporate venture type of approach where we, uh, we can participate to round of financing. And again, uh, support scaling uh, startups and, and, uh, and new ventures. Uh, so they so they can uh, mature and, and fulfill their uh, their overall potential. So NG Factory, you can look it up online or reach out to me, and, and I will uh, put you in touch with the right guys. Perfect. Sounds uh, quite a sophisticated approach, I guess, to working with startups, uh, which is which is nice. They come up with uh, great agility. They, they they are young people like Emir, very bright, very talented, very. Uh, uh, very challenging. They come and challenge us. Uh, honestly, it's a great experience to uh, to have both worlds uh, work together. Fantastic. And Amir, uh, if someone you know someone out there wants to partner with you, uh, I guess what they can just knock on your door. Much easier, right? Yeah, it's quite easy. I mean, like we have our website. We're always happy to talk to uh, technology adopters or technology enablers uh, to end users. Um, and I think one of the suggestions for startups, if, you, if they want to reach out uh, and bridge the gap between, uh, you know, corporates and startups, there are always organizations like SG Innovate. I mean, we are lucky that we are uh, partners uh, and we are a portfolio company of SG Innovate. But there are also organizations like Sustainable Energy Association of Singapore, which basically main job is, uh, is to bridge the gap between um, corporates and, uh, and startups. There is a, a series uh, solar energy institute uh, of Singapore, basically at NUS. There is uh, Arian Energy Research Institute at NTU. Uh, so there's a lot of energy bodies uh, in Singapore which can basically introduce uh, uh, startups to the corporates, provide test bedding opportunity, and etc. Fantastic. So I, I, I'm going to end there. I would like to thank the three panelists, Amir, Lynette, Thomas, so much. Uh, and thank you to the French Chamber. Um, I think it's been a great session. Uh, and again, thank you all for, for attending. And I ho hope the audience is, uh, is walking away with something. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Thank you all. Thank you very thank you. much. Bye. It was really great. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Sorry. Bless you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry for that. Bless you. Thank you. All right, Sunday of News Webinar. Thank you everyone for staying with us till now. Okay, have a great day. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.